Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Deer Society Podcast. I'm Brian Lemke, joined today by JJ Ducart and Brian Clary. We got an exciting podcast for you today. Going to be talking about some cool stuff. We're in the summer. We're approaching fall slowly but surely. Uh, deer season is only a couple months away uh, here in the Upper Midwest. Uh, getting really excited. It's the time of year where we start really diving in, trying to polish up a lot of the work that we're doing. There's a lot of prep work going on: food plots, trail cameras, tree stands. All of the above. It's a, it's an exciting time of year. We're all busy, and uh, it's good. Deer season will be here before you know it. So, what's going on, guys? What have you been up to? Nothing but planting. Uh, just kind of wrapping up with the crops right now. Uh, start doing that slow transition into the fall varieties with brassicas, fall or late season clovers, that kind of thing. Right now, JJ, how about you? Whitetails from scratch property. Give us an update. Yeah. So <clears throat> next three, four weeks is plots and plots and more food plots and and some plots. Um, <laughs> so basically, going from what we were doing with the the corn and beans, um, those type of egg fields now transition, like Brian said, to the fall stuff. So we're doing a lot of testing this year with seed blends, um, single varieties. I'll hopefully, we get into that today a little bit, but. Yeah, it's it's a a big task ahead. Mowing, spraying, you know. There's there's a bunch of different ways to plant too, so we'll, we'll cover some of that. But yeah, the name of the game is plots. Yeah. So for those of you guys that don't know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. We're located up here in southern Minnesota, southeast Minnesota, and you know our growing season is obviously a little different than somebody that's down in Kansas or in the south. So you know when we talk about a lot of these things, it may differ a little bit. Um, you know, Brian, you just mentioned you're, you're getting your last round of beans in today. Uh, yeah. Today. Later this afternoon. Yeah. And that time is really running out. We just actually put ours in, uh, last week. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, beans and corn are in already. Most, uh, you know, they always say here knee high by the fourth for, for corn. Um, you know, a lot of it's getting tall already. Um, beans are growing good. Um, so yeah, making that transition from those, those grain crops into, you know, our, our fall blends. JJ, how did planting go for you guys? Um, Because you did a lot of your own uh, planting of corn and beans um, instead of having a farmer do it. So just walk me through that process a little bit. How'd that go? Yeah, it was an interesting year. We did have the farmer put some crop in uh, corn. We had some some hiccups there. So we had we planted corn on corn through the the farmer. And last year's crop, a lot of the seed got into the soil and basically exploded into a a field of a million corn stalks per acre. Um, so we had to try to control that. We could see the rows. So, you know, running it over and trying to kill off all that new sprout. Um, so had a little bit of a learning, um, curve there with the corn. Then the beans, we did actually plant some of our own beans this year and did it a couple of different ways. I disked in some beans, which was kind of neat, kind of neat way to do it. And then, um, tilled in some beans and, um, the farmer also drilled in some beans. So three different ways, I would say, um, you got to fence them off. If you do the small plots, I don't think a couple of the spots I planted are going to make it. And that's okay. Cause then now's the time we can transition that and replant into the fall mixes. So it's still going to be salvageable or just see what those beans do produce for pods, leave them. And then, you know, just broadcast seed in, in, into that mix too. So a lot of different options. One thing you were talking about, you know, getting the beans in, it, it is okay to put beans in late. Um, you know, we're not looking for like high yield production or anything, no. but that le- that last green field, uh, green bean field coming, you know, come season is going to be the most powerful for the deer. So it, it is nice to have that last green, um, heading into the season, but yeah, you want to get those pods on there too. So it's kind of a balancing act. Yeah. A couple of things there. I, I would say we always try to plant our beans a lo- little later just for that reason specifically. And yeah. we'll talk about that as we get closer to the season, but that's such a huge strategy for us is that first part of the season, you know, September 15th, whatever it is, if you can find those last green bean fields, man, that's where the deer are going to be. You know, as soon as they start turning yellow and, and, you know, changing those deer, it becomes less palatable for them and they, they get off them. But if you have green standing beans and can catch those deer on their summer feeding pattern on a green field, 
can be really, really deadly, you know, that, that first week. And we'll talk about fencing, you know, some of the strategies there. Um, but JJ, I want to bounce back to, you know, you talked about the corn, right? So, you know, you had corn last year, left it standing, then you had the the issue with it this year. So how, what would you have done differently now knowing what you know? Yeah. So two things, <clears throat> obviously we planted too much because the deer didn't eat it all and the raccoons and turkeys and whatnot. The other thing is we had those tornadoes roll through last December, which has never happened ever in Minnesota. So just kind of luck of the draw. Um, all that corn was flattened and maybe not as accessible to the wildlife as it had been when it was in standing row. So kind of a mixed bag of what happened. Um, always good, I guess, to do some rotation of crops. So you can <clears throat> try to combat that a little bit with herbicides and things. But yeah, um, I don't know. I'm not a farmer, so I just kind of try to learn as we go and do the best we can. Yeah. Brian, you have any thoughts on that? Well, no, he, I, I was watching him do it throughout the year when they're growing up and, uh, or when the new corn from last year was coming through the rows that they planted this year. And one thing you have to do when you, when this happens is let that lead, uh, shoot from each corn stock, get like 12 inches tall. Otherwise, if you keep cutting it back, it'll just keep regrowing. But once that lead shoots out and you cut it, then that plant is dead. So then he did the right thing by getting rid of it. Well, no, that's good. So now, you know, transitioning into a little bit of, you know, talking about fall plots. And I guess before we do that, let's talk about beans and, and fencing beans. So one thing that's becoming more common and common, you're seeing it more, we've done it now for a few years, is fencing off sections of beans um, to try to keep the deer out of there, you know, so they don't all get eaten up before you can take advantage of them, right? I know last year we fenced off about an acre um, and we didn't take the fence down until November, I think it was. And, you know, that can be different. You can take it down a little earlier, obviously, but you know, the key there is just taking the fence down when you're ready to hunt it. Because if you can keep the deer out of there, keep that, that bean crop good, you know, especially into that later season, um, you know, that can be really, a really, really good strategy too. So Brian, talk me through, you know, your thought process on, uh, fencing, how big, you know, of an area should you fence and what time of type of fencing do you like to use? Yeah. Uh, well, if it's under like an acre and a half to an acre, so semi smaller bean fields, you always want to fence that off cause they're going to get mowed down right away. Um, if it's over that, then you can sometimes get away with it. But um, with the fencing, one one thing that I've always learned how to or learned to do that has been really effective is having a screen around your beans, um, and then having the fencing outside of that, so they don't have that visual aspect when they're trying to jump. Um, you can go with a, you can go with an electric fence, but you don't necessarily need to. You can double up rows of like a like a white fabric tape. Uh, as your rope and just something that's very visible to the deer. So when they're jumping over it and they have two rows to get over, they're going to be a little more hesitant and back them off. So those two rows. Now, when he talks about this, he's talking about, you know, one fence basically inside another and spread out. I don't know what, yeah, three, like three, three four, four feet, five feet, you know, so think of a deer jumping over one fence. You want to make it so that when a deer jumps over that first fence, they're pretty much going to jump into that second fence right. and run into it. So you take away their ability. We all know that deer can jump ridiculously yeah. high. Um, but, you know, you, you try to deter them from jumping over the first fence because they're going to jump into that second fence. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the theory behind that. Right. Yeah, create, create an uncomfortable situation to where they get kind of confused and don't want to take a risk of jumping into that second wire. Yeah, it just kind of pushes them off a little bit when they see that there's that secondary line behind it that they, you know. Yeah, that... yeah I think, you know, what's worked really well for us too, and, it, and it, it's different in every situation, but I think you have to look at the way that your plot's set up. And you don't necessarily have to fence the whole thing either. You know, we have, if we, if we plant three acres in beans... We might only fence off an acre of it and, you know, do that strategically. Again, thinking about where we're going to hunt early and where we're going to hunt late, but, you know, fence off an acre of it, keep that one for later. And then those other two beans, you can still try or other two acres. You can still try to take advantage of that early. And those deer still have something to eat, you know, to, to get them through, you know, the, the first part of the season. And, you know, so I think just goes 
back to ev- anything that we do, you know, like there's a strategy behind it. We're not just fencing something off just to fence it off or, you know, just there's a, there's a, a pregame strategy that goes into it that puts the odds in your favor when it comes to hunting. So, you know, when you're doing your food plots, whether it's beans or brassicas or whatever it is, or a screen, all of those things, think about them on the front end and how they're going to benefit you when it's the time to hunt the deer. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, a lot of strategy goes into it on the front end. So I'll break down just three examples of the beans that we planted this year. So two of them were at Whitetails from Scratch, um, IMAX. That's, so that's an acre and a half next to 10 acres of beans that the farmer will harvest. So, you know, that acre and a half, we did not fence. We plan to, you know, broadcast more fall blends on top of that when they dry out a little bit. But having 10 acres standing next to it takes off so much pressure that you know you're not as worried about deer just hitting that acre and a half and taking it out so that was not fenced um all my scenarios are not fenced but testing all three um the the other one was a half acre on the east side of um cedar springs over there white tails from scratch and just put it in it was a new plot opened up took out a bunch of trees and just kind of threw it in there um round up ready beans so we could you know, spray out the weeds coming up, see how the deer, how heavy that pressure was, because there's no beans really anywhere nearby. So I was hoping if the herd kind of was bedding and eating out in the main egg fields, they wouldn't be internally like next to that small one. Uh, Maybe pressure was lower. So testing that out, I don't think that one's going to survive too well. They're about six inches tall now. And then the third one is in Wisconsin. Planted one acre beans, no fence, disked it in but I put in two acres of seed and fertilized it. So like a double batch, disc it in, round up ready so I could spray the weeds out. And the deer dens- density is extremely low and there's no beans anywhere around. So um, I think that one's gonna do fine. That's one acre, so it's not fenced. So just three different scenarios, you know, going based on densities and kind of what's around uh, different properties and just overall strategy. So just kind of always testing, you know, and that's kind of what this podcast is going to be about, you know, food plots, different methods, different seed types, and then just always experimenting and trying to improve. So. Oh yeah. And you made a good point. (laughs) You made a good point too, with the uh, one that's standing next to the 10 acres that you're going to go in and plant in your fall brassicas. And that's, I mean, that's something that a lot of people overlook is getting, when it's still green, go in there, broadcast over the top of them. They start to brown up. You start seeing that green foliage coming in from underneath, and that's a huge draw for the herd to come back into that area. Yeah, let's dive into that a little more. So what we're talking about now is adding basically green to your grains, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, we could think about them as separate things, and you could think about just your fall brassica food plots or whatever. But, you know, another strategy is to go in, like you said, broadcast, you know, some greens, some brassicas, whatever, and we could talk about what you'd recommend to do that. But putting greens right there in your grain, that way you're giving them the full smorgasbord. Like you're giving them options there. Then your beans start to die, you know, or or turn brown. And then you have green coming up too. So like late season, especially, you know, the the green gets you through the season. Then late season, if you can keep some of those beans there and then you can offer them the grain and the beans and the green takes the guessing game out of it because so many times when you hear people talk about it, it's like, well, should I sit green or should I sit green tonight? What's the temperature? What's the weather? And I don't mm-hmm. know that there's a, a, a specific uh, method or rhyme or reason to if deer are going to go to grain or green, you know, it, there's certain factors that you could guess on. But if you can give them both things right there, man, that's, again, putting yeah. odds in your favor. So when you're going in, when is the right time to go in and broadcast, you know, greens, over you know maybe some beans when's the right time to do that and and how do you do it right time to do it for us in the upper midwest uh anywhere from like july 25th to the first maybe the second week of august um as you move further south you can get away with it later into the season uh later into august and even sometimes early september for like down in georgia florida that area um but the best time to do it here is definitely right at that like August 1st mark. Um, you're gonna, we get a lot of good rains at that time of the year. It's gonna help kind of saturate the seeds that are just broadcasted over the top down into the soil bed. Um, and then depending on when you plant the beans, that when they start browning up and let, letting the sunlight down through to the soil, it's gonna just help that, uh, that growth, I mean, daily. 
Yeah. And I just think, you know, it's different everywhere, obviously timing. Um, I just look back, our season comes in mid September. Typically beans are already brown, the ones that are harvested by, you know, the farming community. Um, so then you kind of just backtrack that. Well, when's the last time you typically see green? Usually late August. Yeah. Okay. So if you got the seed in at least a couple weeks before that, um, you know, mid August would even be okay. I think for, for throwing that on top. Yeah. When we're planting those mixes, it's normally that first week in August or so. So, I mean, that's ideal, but if they're shaded out, then yeah, maybe they won't do as well. So you could bump it back a couple weeks, maybe, but just kind of, you know, when did your farmer plant? Cause you can do this in not just a food plot area, but you could ask your farmer yeah. if you can just broadcast in his crop. He probably doesn't care or even I want to ask him. He might not know, but probably ask yeah, him. probably um, ask him. <laughs> yeah. He might be okay with it. I've talked to ours and you know, he said, I can broadcast into the corn if i want to do some rye in there or brassicas and the beans he didn't really care so um another option yeah and i've seen a lot of people do it in the corn it's not as much sunlight getting down to the ground but still very effective if you do like you said some type of rye grass that doesn't need too much sun exposure or yeah i think you know. yeah so just look at what your your farmer's doing too if he's planting your beans because ours is using a 30 inch row planter so that's a little bit wider than some maybe using or drilling in so maybe there's more sunlight yeah i mean in our beans than a different source so that's a lot of little things but yeah i mean in general that late july early august mid-august would be a good time to yeah it really depends on when you put the beans in yeah i mean you get the life cycle out of them they start browning up and you kind of want it in maybe a week before they start browning up i one important thing that you have to understand is when when you're broadcasting that seed over the beans, you have to make sure that you're getting that seed soil contact, right? So, you know, if you have really, really lush beans, I mean, I'm sure the seed's going to get down there, but that could affect it too. Correct. You got to make sure you have that seed to soil contact with that new stuff that you're planting. And I would say, make sure that if you're going to go do this again, pay attention to where you're doing it. Don't just go and randomly walk all over in your field and do it. You know, put the greens where you want them, where you want to hunt them. It's interesting, um, you know, working with the guys over at Homegrown and Love the Grind, they have a really uh, intimate approach to how they design their food plots. And one of the things that they do a lot is use, um, you know, brassicas and greens going into the fall mixed in with their beans and, and corn and things like that. And they'll what they'll actually do is they'll go in and uh, they'll mow certain sections of their beans and then go in and plant those in brassicas. Now you might look at that and say, well, man, it seems like you're wasting a lot of beans. But, you know, when you look at it, they're, they're not going to harvest these beans. They're, they're leaving them standing. They have plenty of food there, you know, grain wise to get these deer through. And they're going in and mowing these areas that all help flow together. And they, they refer to them as brassica walking strips. So that when these deer come out, like they try to make them so that they're actually guiding the deer where they want them to go. Um, just another way that one, they're, they're ensuring that seed to soil contact. And two, you know, they're really trying to navigate, use those brassica walking strips and those greens within the grains to make everything flow and really guide those deer where they want them to go when they want them to go there. Right. And one other point with that is not overseeding. Um, you overseed underneath the beans and they all come up at the same time once they start to brown up everything's going to choke itself out. So going kind of a lighter application on this strategy works well in your favor down the road when you're actually hunting. Right on. Well, no, that's all good stuff. Let's go into uh, just fall plots. So let's get, let's get away from grains a little bit and just go into, you know, are our, our your fall blast, brassica plots? Um, what are you looking to plant this year, Brian? Doing some testing, uh, some new hybrid varieties, um, going, I mean, still with some purple top turnips, bullseye turnips, kale, rapeseed, stuff like that. But there are a few new hybrids that are available that I definitely want to try out and see how they work, see how they're effective to the deer and what kind of traffic they pull in. So, but that's, I, I got, I don't know, probably three, four acres of brassicas that I'll be putting in over the next few weeks. Yep. So... 
over the next few weeks, again, kind of that same time frame that we talked about, there's no difference. Nebraska's, um, you know, that up here for us, you know, we're, we're in the July now, mid July, yep. um, the next three, four weeks is really the time to get those in JJ. What have you done in the past? What have you seen work good and what's your strategy this year? Yeah. So these mixes that we typically use, um, <clears throat> the brassica, the turnips, the um, radishes and whatnot. Yeah, putting those in late July, early August has always done really well. And then we do some rye and oats and different um, grain type grass seed blends a little bit later. You got more time with those. They can sprout fairly quick. So those are kind of the two windows. Um, try not to mix them too much just because if that rye and oats gets too mature then it's it real stocky and yeah. not real palatable but um you know this year we're getting pretty pretty intense into the testing side of things so between whitetails from scratch and then um different properties we're working working plots in and test plots and whatnot um we're going to map that out and basically just do a full-on test of every seed we can think about and different varieties and film the process take photos and just kind of really see what works best and try to share all that information um, next season and throughout the fall. So um, I know we're going to map out different brass areas and strips of, you know, say it's a kale strip or a turnip strip or, you know, just try to split some stuff up, um, mix some blends together, experiment with the grain green concept and just, you know, across the board, do as much research and content creation, I guess, on that side of things as possible. That's, that's the plan this year. So I want to, I want to talk about food plot placement a little bit, you know, so we, everybody talks about food plots and, you know, at this point in the year, you know, most of those food plot locations are probably already established and, and they're ready to go. And when you are looking for a place to put a food plot, you know, and let's talk about a kill pot plot or a, a fall brassica plot, uh, where are you looking? What kind of areas are you trying to, to put those plots in? Typically, I like to see the greens leading into the big grain. Just kind of find that little um, that little pinch or staging area. That's what that's worked well for me in the past um, on multiple occasions across the board in Wisconsin, Minnesota. Wait till oh. some scratch, but that's that's what I like to do. Some some of the properties that we hunt are really hilly. So what I like to do is get in and deep into the timber where I can find sunlight coming through the canopy and put in some of those micro plots. It might only be an eighth of an acre. And when you hit in those hard transition zones, uh, ridge top, stuff like that, but you got enough sunlight to let, let the seeds germinate and actually mature. Those are some of the best areas that I've found in the past few years. I mean, I've just recently started putting these ones in our own family farm and the amount of pictures we get in the, when you're sitting in stand, the amount of deer traffic you get coming in just to, quick bite to eat on those micro plots are huge. And that's now turning into one of my more favorite areas to hunt is just those m smaller micro plots. Yeah, absolutely. I think that what you're doing is you're not creating main destination food sources for these deer. So I think you have to remember that when you're, when you're talking about fall food plots or small kill plots, right? You're looking for those areas where you think that maybe a mature buck might go to grab a quick bite or on his way out to his main destination food almost kind of creating a social area and giving him something sweet to to grab a bite to eat on his way out or his way back from a big destination spot so look for those transition areas if you can get them back in the timber close to bedding as long as you can access it you know where a big buck can get up before dark and transition there stage there before he makes his way out to a, a bigger destination food. Plant. Well, and they feel so much more comfortable when they're back in the timber too, on the way to their main destination food plots. You know, they they get up from their bed sometimes an hour before sun sundown, and they're back in there eating for 15, 20 minutes. They, I mean, it's not to say they just take one or two bites and walk through. It's they'll hang out there for a little bit, and the amount of rub and scrape activity that I've seen on those micro plots is considerably different from the remainder of the property. Yeah. And there's a spot that just comes to mind every time I think about a, a little kill plot and it's that hidden plot. Wait till some scratch. I know you mentioned access <clears throat> last year, this spot was set up where it was, um, mostly winter rye with a little bit of brassica in there. 
and it led out to a cornfield. And there was three or four times where I passed up a buck, four-year-old buck. I named him Curly Fry, so hopefully he's around this year. But I was able to access because the elevation change. Get into the stand, play the right wind. You know, he came through, filmed him, went out to Big Egg. I got out. Did it again. You know, did it again. So was not bumping any deer. And that's a, a huge thing with these little kill plots and little transition plots too is getting in and out because when you hunt over a big, you know, bean field or ag field and it's cut, it's almost impossible to get out sometimes at night. So little kill plots, if you can plan everything correctly on the front end, you know, get that access right, that's it's going to give you a lot more opportunity um, long term. Let's talk about the process of planting one of these food plots. So from start to finish, if somebody wants to go out there and plant some brassicas, um, you know, they decide what blend they want to use. How should, like, what does that process look like from kind of start to finish? There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, determining where you're at or where you're putting the plot, going in, killing everything off, whether that be spraying, mowing, some type of herbicide. Uh, then working the soil is, the I mean, getting that soil turned over, letting the seeds flush through again, spraying and killing it again. Otherwise, a lot of times people go in and put their seed down, they'll get a flush of weeds that come through at the same time as their food source and just chokes out the entire plot. So spraying it multiple times has been really effective, but especially on like first time plots when you're, if you're just starting one this year, getting that sprayed the first initial time, go in, turn the soil over, go in a couple weeks later, spray it again, then you're getting ready to plant. So then you're going in and broadcasting. Are you doing anything after you broadcast that seed? It depends on the variety. Um, sometimes you want it down into the soil. Sometimes it's top, top soil, just soil contact. And um, I guess it, you, you structure your game plan a little bit differently depending on the variety. But say brassicas, for instance, you, it's, you can put it on the top of the soil. It's best to get it eighth of an inch to a quarter inch under the soil to help that germination process and the heat of the sun so it's not killing everything off right away. JJ, I know you've had some experience with this and tried a few different methods on the White Tails from Scratch Farm and had some success and, and some opposite. Um, you know, there's different ways with different seeds to get that, you know, seed pack down in the soil a little bit. You know, you could drag it, you can use a call to pack, or you can use a roller few different options there what have you experienced um, with some of those different techniques well, I can tell you that the quality of soil has a big part of it um, plays in the success because you know whenever we're working those bottom areas in the rich black soil I mean you could basically you can mess it up pretty good and still get a pretty good food plot but <clears throat> those tops that are you know, have been washed away and um, that top soil is pretty much gone it's a struggle so you know getting that process correct um, and having the right fertilizer on there and really knowing what's going on with your soil is, is a huge part of it. Um, and a lot of those areas, we're trying to build the soil up a little bit with some clovers and rye and, you know, trying yeah. to buckwheat and trying to actually get some, some good organic matter back into that because they are pretty poor. Um, but yeah, that, that standard method that you kind of explained there with, uh, working up the soil and putting seed down and, um, we've, we've done drags or the cultipacker. Um, to pack that seed in but yeah you don't want to get it too deep that's always kind of been the method and then the proper fertilizer but um yeah soil soil quality is huge yeah and when you're working say a annual like a brassica that's going to die off and not come back again next year it's a little bit different than if you're doing a clover or rye you know you to condition the soil prior to it's good good idea to one get a soil test done on that plot or that area of the field um getting either lime down or high potassium phosphates just in those really bare soils that's going to help build the nutrients to get like the clover roots or the winter rye just something like you were saying getting that organic matter back down underneath the soil bed will help the germination process and the longevity of that stand have you ever had any experience or, or uh, how, do you have a feeling on, you know, there's some mixes out there that, that they market as like a throw and grow mix or whatever, where you're not working up the soil, you're basically going in and you're, you're just broadcasting soil or broadcasting seed, I'm sorry, you know, on the ground um, without really doing anything else. Have you had any experience with that at all? I have. I mean, years ago, I would try, try stuff like that, I guess, but 
I haven't ever had the best success with it. Um, just being the, you got to get the area cleared out. You know, you can't just go out into the woods, throw it down. You're going to land on leaf matter, dead decayed branches, stuff like that. And it's not getting down to the soil. So you got to get the area cleared. So at least it's hitting the soil bed. Once it hits the soil bed and it does grow, you're going to have, I mean, depending on the varieties of what that mix is, you're going to have some type of success as far as the growth of it. The one thing that I would always stress is getting the fertilizers in later after those plants do come up, if that's the method that you're going with, just to help get the germination, or not the germination, but the plant growth process up to its highest ability, you know, to maximize the stand. Yeah, and even part of what we're doing this year with all of our test plots is mm -hmm. that liquid fertilizer, like you mentioned, yeah. <clears throat> on top of the granular stuff. So there's just a bunch of different stuff you can do, um, and we're experimenting with all that this year on the different, you know, from clover, yeah. from trying different fertilizers to uh, some of the fall blends. But yeah, if you're in the middle of the woods, you got to clear that debris. You got to get that seed to soil contact. Yeah. And I've done some throw and go type stuff. Um, even out in the open where you have plenty of sunlight, but if it's a grass, kind of a thatch layer, like you just you just can't get that seed to penetrate and grow out there. You really got to work it up. I know a couple of years back, the tiller broke, so I was kind of forced to just mow, spray, and then throw seed on top, throw and grow, throw and go, whatever you call it. Um, and it didn't work at all, so. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> no, he, co no contact to the soil. He's right, though. When you got years and years of plant growth in that area and you go out there and spray the thatch laying on the ground you can't rely on the rain to push the seed down to the soil bed you have to get that stuff out of the way before you go out there and spread your mix yeah so for somebody that's that's sitting there right now listening thinking about doing food plots this year what what is one piece of, of advice that you would give them uh, right now in looking at doing food plots coming up here <laughs> well i hope that they've determine where their food plot's going by now in the season but if you haven't get out there and spray right now uh whether it's a throw and grow method or i mean any variety that we're going with get out there spray right now mow it down as close to the soil as you can don't ruin your equipment but get it down as close to the soil i mean even going out there with a weed whacker and a rake you're going to be able to move enough debris out of the way that you're going to get some type of germination and uh, plant growth coming in through that um but if you haven't found your <laughs> food plot destinations yet then i would say i'd say do a lot of spraying this week and then next week <laughs> just get it as dead as possible and i uh, make sure that you got enough sunlight i guess <laughs> Yeah, and if you can get any access to equipment, um, I know we've done plots with four-wheelers with little discs behind them where you have to go over the same spot about 300 times. Um, little cultivators, those work really well. Someone You could even rent or buy a little um, push rototiller. I mean, that yep. might take a while, but just get that, that ground worked up, drag any kind of metal. I mean, if you have a four-wheeler, you can drag anything to d disrupt that soil. I mean, it can't hurt. So, right. um, yeah, just trying to mow it and really get that ground prepped is the biggest part. Spraying it, glyphosate, uh, which is like the Roundup. And just get that seed to soil contact and kind of use it as an experiment. And we're going to share as, as much you know information and results coming up in the next year as we possibly can to help different scenarios from, mm -hmm. you know, big equipment to just small do-it-yourself do type situations. And, you know, we're learning, but we're using a lot of years of experience too and share everything we can and, you know, yeah. they should be able to learn, you know, learn as you go. Yeah, Everybody's you, learning. You, so. you made a really good point with that though. I mean, going out there with like years ago before I had any equipment, I'd go out there with a chain link fence with a couple cinder blocks tacked onto a two by four on the back and drag that around just to disrupt the soil and get stuff moved off, you know, but did you have a four wheeler, or you just no. threw it on your back? <laughs> and just no. drug it. Had, had a four wheeler, <laughs> but I mean minimal minimal equipment to do kind of bigger fields. People use trucks, and yeah. it depends on how tight the space is. <laughs> People to yeah. use trucks, yeah, all kinds of things. I mean, whatever you can use, whatever you can get access to. I mean, you know, any little bit helps. You know, yeah. the reality is we 
we all don't have access to all the pieces of equipment that that we want you know jj i'm sure that you could think of 30 more pieces of equipment that you would buy tomorrow if if you know everything was reality you know you got to use the resources that you have available to you and take the the basics of of you know food plots and understanding and clear in that matter and seed to soil contact and do what you can with it and hope like hell it rains and it grows you know um what else food plot wise should we talk about well there's and then you want to talk about a little bit the the clover stuff we've been doing that's aside from the fall plots we, yeah. we did that back in you know some frost seeding in, yeah. the, in the late winter early spring um but is clover something i know you're a big fan and you got you know some blends of your own and mm -hmm. have been testing different varieties like is that something that you feel like is more of a starter compared to the brassica side or is it you, or is it just kind of you preference? can still get it in right now um but yeah we i mean i've got one test plot that i'm putting in this afternoon that's going to be a uh, five blend uh clover and chicory mix just to get that soil established for next year and i know that it, it's got plenty of sun exposure it's going to germinate just fine the only thing is it's in a fresh field and i went out there three weeks ago sprayed it Went out there again last week, sprayed it, going to work the soil, and then top seed it today. But I know from experience now is I'm going to have to go out there in another two weeks when that soil gets disrupted, how we're going to, I mean, we're going to do a full like six inch till. That soil bed, all the seeds over the years that have dropped down into that soil bed that got too deep, that didn't get the heat from the sun to germinate, that's going to get brought up to the surface and there's going to be grass littered throughout that entire field. So... There are sprays you can use or herbicides you can use to combat that once the once your clover is starting to come out of the ground. But that's it's not too late to put clover in. I guess is my point. If you choose the right variety. If you yeah. choose the right variety, yeah. you need something that's a little quicker starting because usually clover is between like a ten and fourteen day germination process. And once it germinates, I mean, you're going to see little tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of green coming out of the ground and you're like, well, this isn't going to go anywhere, but then you just need a couple more rains and fertilizer. No, all good stuff. That's great. Um, what is the one thing that you were talking about there? Certain herbicides, is there a specific one that you like to use or if you've seen success with that you can go in after that, that has come up, that's not going to kill your food plot too. Right. So if you got alfalfa or clover, um, it really doesn't matter on the type of variety that you have for either alfalfa or clover but i've used uh this product called fusilade it's a kind of a oily herbicide so you need to mix it with crop seed oil do i think it's one part fusilade to two parts crop seed oil um and then get your correct mixing quantities into whatever tank you're using i use a 35 gallon tank so it goes a long ways i think it's only like eight ounces per 30 gallon so yeah it's kind of an exciting year for uh, the, the team around here doing a lot of testing and a lot of yeah. monitoring and documenting to see, you know, how the growth goes one and two, you know, how the deer utilize it throughout the year, mm -hmm. you know, we'll be running a lot of reveal trail cameras and be out there quite a bit, just documenting how the deer are using different things. And, um, we'll be able to share a lot with you, uh, obviously next year and after the season, but you know, on social media and those types of things, we'll, we'll definitely be, you know, updating as we go and, and sharing findings so kind of an exciting year always learning like jj said i mean we've we've all had success and failure with when it comes to food plots and that that's the kind of exciting thing you, you hate to have those failures i know last year jj you had kind of a nightmare with with your food plots what what was the deal last year Wait, on which one <laughs> <laughs> that explains how jj's year went but um no with the with the bugs last year oh <clears throat> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was unique. We had a um hatch of army worms that pretty much wiped out all the the rye and oat plots pretty late in the year, like in August. And basically brought us down to, you know, reseeding a week or two before the season, which was not ideal. Um and it didn't turn out too well. So I guess you never really know. I mean, I went and sprayed right away when I found out that, you know, and actually the reveals kind of tipped me off when the, the plots started turning brown, when they should have been greening up real nice and growing fast. Um, some of those rye fields, and they pretty much just disappeared within a week. 
I went out there and had been seeing some stuff on social media where people were seeing these army worms and big hatches and um, they were coming off certain ag fields that the farmers were not spraying and harvesting. I think alfalfa is where they made it, might have come from by us. I'm not really sure, actually, something to our west. But And they came through and they just wiped out, you know, a half dozen of our plots um, <clears throat> that were kind of those tough to grow, like poor soil. You know, we were trying to build the soil in those spots, that organic matter, and pretty much wipe those out. So, yeah, you're always learning. You never really know that's apparently like a 10 year cycle on those worms so we shouldn't have to worry about it for a while but hopefully not I always have a backup plan i guess and buy some extra seed i don't know it was it was tough i i had a similar situation last year but it wasn't army worms it was just higher deer density in that certain area i had about a three quarter acre brassica plot coming up great got probably six eight inches out of the ground and then the deer discovered it there's not any grain field within probably a half mile of where the set was and within and got tipped off by the reveal cameras i was seeing 30 40 50 deer on this three quarter acre plot every night for a week straight and they ate that down to the dirt so i had to replant and yeah what was it august 20th <laughs> it was late but luckily got some chicory and stuff like that to come back up so so question for you what did you do differently this year with that uh, plot that plot i did all clover and alfalfa now this year um just kind of the kind of the hinting that just the deer density in that area not near any any uh uh crop or anything like that where they can go out and feed and take some of the pressure off of the plot um do it in clover re regenerates helps the soil kind of a win-win-win for both the deer herd and myself keeping a nice green pasture for them now yeah so that was a good move um something they can browse on it's gonna last all year perennial clover type thing now the only bad part about that strategy wise is when that frost really hits then those you know the clover fields kind of um yeah. not as attractive to deer so keep that in mind too if you do go a full-on you know clover chicory alfalfa route but um can be a great addition if you kind of have a couple different options close by the one thing that i'm planning to do in that plot is putting in a very light coating of uh hail coming into the season just to have that bigger plant lush nutrition especially when the frost hits the kale is going to spike in sugars and they'll be in there heavy on hitting the kale plants then i know you tested some kale last year um and, you know, again, we're talking more specifically here in southern Minnesota. How did that kale do last year? How did you did you see the deer interact with, with the kale plot? They, they were in it not super heavy until probably the end of August, or October. Um, they got it once, once that first frost hits and the sugar spikes, pushes all the sugar out to the foliage of the plants. They were in that every night and they, I mean, it was still standing end of November, but they were hitting it every night really, really consistently. But at that time, I was already tagged out, so I was just watching them on the cameras. Right on. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. I, hope, <laughs> not, I hope I'm in that boat, too. I hope that I don't have to worry about any of my food plot, fall plots this year because I, I'm just going to shoot one on the first day over standing green bean field and be done with it. Right? Yeah. Well, no, that's all good stuff. Lots of good information there on food plots. We'll definitely keep you updated and, and let you know what we find, and hopefully you're able to to kind of recommend some cool stuff for, for next year and the years to come, um, kind of doing some new, cool, innovative things. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah, and kind of piggybacking off of the last podcast with Andy, you know, adding any sweeteners to these plots too, you know, water holes and scrapes and running our reveal cameras on there, um, seeing the girl, seeing the intel, big part of the food plot situation too. For sure. Yeah, I mean, a anything that you can do to continue to to stack the deck in your favor and give the deer what they want in one location where it's advantageous advantageous to you, you know, as a hunter, you know, the the better. So yeah, definitely water hole or, um, you know, rubbing posts or you know scrape areas. Those kill plots make great uh, platforms or or for you know a scrape tree or. Um, even a cedar post out in the middle of them, you know, we talked about that and, and I know JJ, you're going to do a couple of those this year in some certain places. So, um, yeah, definitely just creating those kind of little social areas is, is yeah. Cement cool. those into the ground. I've had them pushed over too many times. I yeah. Mean, and that's part <laughs> of the experimenting, you know, yeah. <clears throat> we're looking at different size water holes. We're looking at different scrape 
yeah. um, configurations with posts and uh, products that maybe have a spring system or a hemp, you know, rope. And um, it's all about learning. Yeah. That's the fun, fun part. process. That's, that's definitely the exciting part about it. So yeah, I mean, what else is going on right now in the summer? I can think of about a million things that, that we're all working on. Um, obviously a great time. If you haven't done it, get out there and, and trim your tree stands, like get everything dialed in now because the season is coming in a hurry. The, the less amount of pressure that you can put on your deer herd as we get closer to the season, um, the more that's going to help you. Uh, I know one of the things that's coming up for us, which is always super exciting, you know, you're, you're seeing them on the reveals growing now and you see these velvet pictures floating around and some are further along than others. And, you know, I feel like we're at that point where it's always like, Connor just mentioned to me today, he's like, man, I don't have a big buck on camera yet. And I'm like, dude, you need, to, you need to calm down. It's, yeah. it's all right. We're still in July. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, starting to really get that excitement with these deer growing and seeing them and velvet scouting is, is going to be a big deal That's for us. Here one of my favorite times of the up. year. I actually prefer no big bucks on camera right now because we're doing all this work on the property and we're trying to prep it for the fall to kind of peak out, you know, uh, with the plots and everything. So like being in there and, um, if the deer are not using your, your area and they're on these big ag fields out kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, or just on somebody else's property, that's fine because, you know, we're doing all the work, we're setting all the traps and we don't really want them to pick up on that anyway. So, you know, set those traps. It's time. It's, it's great to see them there now, but when you really want them there is when you can hunt them. Right. So, yep. you know, it, it's, I, I don't know if it was Mark Drew that said it one time, he kind of said the same thing. I was listening to a podcast that he was talking and he said, you know what? He said, I, I, I would rather not have any big bucks on my farm until, you know, we get into that big switch because it happens and we see it every single year. And we'll talk about it later on when we get a little closer to the season, but you can be on that, that farm where your cameras are blowing up and you have all these big bucks and you can't wait for opening day. And then opening day comes and maybe a bean field turns or something changes, or just we're in that time of year where, you know, deer shedding their velvet and you know, that testosterone levels are changing. They're, they're figuring out their home core areas and you can go from feast to famine really quick, you know, so not having a big deer on camera right now, isn't, isn't the, the end of the world. That's for sure. Um, you know, as far as velvet scouting wise, I know we spend a lot of time, you know, in the evenings driving around, looking for deer, spending time out on our properties, um, you know, scouting from a distance. What, uh, what are some techniques that, that you use or where do you see a lot of your, your bigger, more mature bucks or bigger deer herds this time of year and, and some advice for somebody that might want to get out and do some velvet scouting? This time of the year, they're in, I mean, starting to get into the bean fields as they're coming up. The beans aren't quite high enough here that they're going to be hitting it too heavily, but at corn fields, they're kind of hitting that point where they're a little bit too tall now to see the bodies of the deer, but they're going to be in there and you'll see the heads poking up. Um, focusing right before sundown on like field edges, stuff like that, where you can down crop, crop edges. They're going to hang tight to the edge of the field just with the heat out and getting that little bit of shade. Yeah, I mean, pretty much soybeans coming up and then alfalfa yeah. and, you know, big oh. open pastures that have a good good food source. Once you find them, mm -hmm. just park for the next 30 days every night. Alfalfa, alfalfa especially this time of the year, though. Yeah, they're in, in alfalfa and clover strips in between, like, cornfield rows or cornfield sections, stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then obviously, like you said too, soybeans is always a great one, and that's going to get even better as we get, you know, start to get, you know, into into August and and that kind of thing. In the evenings, that's the time to get them. Yeah. You know, like that's they're they're bachelored up a lot of times right now. You know, these these bucks are together right now. They're tolerating each other. They know where the the good food sources are. They know where they want to be, so they'll tolerate each other and and you know access those those food sources a lot of times in the daylight. So you know where there's one, a lot of times this time of year you'll find more. So yeah. you know find those spots and uh, focus on soybeans, alfalfa, those types of things, and yeah. and uh, yeah. Send us some photos or videos on social media. We'll be looking for them. I know we'll, yep. Brian's out there. If, if you see Brian's black truck driving around the, the <laughs> southern Minnesota area, that's probably him. He's got it's red, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Blue, green, <laughs> LR spotter out the window. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but uh, definitely a, a, an exciting, fun time of year for, for sure for all of us here. Yeah. Shoot the bow. Yeah. Get shoot the bow dialed in and get those, those traps set. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know one of the things that that we're doing right now too that we've always had really good success with is, um, you know, just clearing access trails you know, especially along field edges, you know, dialing in your access because you can dial in your tree stand, but if you can't get there, uh, undetected and, and easily, um, dial in those access trails. I mean, I, Lance, uh, a buddy of mine, he actually rented, uh, cause we didn't have access to a big mower. Um, he rented just a push behind mower and he walked every field edge that we had, you know, about this time of year last year. And we're, we're going to do that same thing again, just to do whatever we can to, to clear access trails and, um, man, it paid off in a big way last year, especially like along a cornfield. Hey, you know, if you have a cornfield that you can use to your advantage and you can slip in um, and, and use that to, to not be seen, a lot of times those farmers, they plant so tight up to the edge that, it, you know, maybe it's thick and they, yeah, the cornfield's great, but you have to have a way to get along there quietly uh, to and from your tree stand. So, you know, thinking about that too, do whatever you can to, to make sure your access is, and is minimizing good. your scent behind having that tall grass that you're walking through. When you mow that down, you're not rubbing your legs on stuff. Yeah. There's a point where we get real cautious with our scent control coming up <clears throat> and it's not for, you know, maybe a month or so before the season, but prepping that, that stuff now, you know, like you said, edge of an egg field, tree falls down, you know, bring your saw out there, cut that limb out, um, get that clean trail. And then even in the timber, you know, really raking off those. If, if you got a short trek through the timber and it's right off an egg field or, or something easy, easily accessible, just kind of walk that trail, mark it a little bit, trim kind of the branches that would hit you in the face or yeah. gather scent from your, you know, your body or whatever. So you can get in there without touching anything, you know, get, get your clean boots, um, walking through, you're not breaking branches, just clear that nice trail right to your tree stand. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into the scent control aspect of that a little bit later but mm -hmm. um prepping those trails is huge well exciting stuff happening like i said food plots going in busy couple weeks for us ahead we'll definitely be keeping you posted capturing a lot of content more whitetails from scratch coming on youtube so check that out obviously dear sighty social media we're always posting on there so thanks for listening make sure if you haven't done so already download the dear society app it's free if you're watching on youtube make sure you subscribe Thanks for listening. Good luck out there with your plots, and uh, we look forward to seeing your success. Well, I'm a deer hunting man. Well, I'm a deer hunting man. The Deer Society's success has been built on great partnerships with great product makers, such as Illusion Systems, maker of the Extinguisher Deer Call, the Black Rack Rattling System, and the Phase Body Odor System. Tacticam and Reveal, Osseo Gear, 10-Point Crossbows, Burris Optics, Huyman, and Big Frig.